Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> First Timothy 6. We're in our book study of 1 Timothy and coming now to this wonderful chapter of uh, chapter 6. <clears throat> it begins by addressing the servant-master relationship. We say, well, pastor, we don't have servants and masters today. Some of you say, wait a minute, you don't know my boss. <laughs> <clears throat> but it does uh, depict for us the employee-employer relationship and a lot of the principles is uh, that of the same, and we are applying it to that. Uh, every home is affected by the employee-employer relationship, uh, either husband or wife uh, in the home, sometimes uh, older children also involved in working with jobs, and it's important to have an understanding of a proper biblical work ethic. And that's what Paul addresses here in the first two verses of chapter 6. Unfortunately, there's some in America uh, that uh, work, they view their job as a necessary evil and which they must do in order to enjoy the entertainment uh, uh, options that they would like in their life. Uh, you probably have seen the bumper sticker that sums it up. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Uh, it's that type of mentality that they got to work and it's not anything of enjoyment. Uh, it's just going through to, to get through the day so I can get a paycheck, so I do what I want to do and be able to pay for what, what I need to pay. Um, a lot of life is uh, unfortunately uh, having responsibilities that come into play. Uh, but I hope that you can find a job and have uh, look for a job that you can do and enjoy the work that you do. Uh, it should be fulfilling in our life as what God has, has made it, as we'll see uh, momentarily. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, there are some that are very unhappy in their work uh, situations, and some of those people are Christians. And because of that, uh, that attitude towards work makes it very difficult uh, to have and to display a biblical work ethic. And so I want to encourage you today as we look at this and look at what God says about how you should view the job that God has uh, given you and given the opportunity to do. And for those that, uh, that are over you as a supervisor or your boss, uh, whatever title that may uh, come into that, uh, how do you work for them? What is your mentality toward them? Father, I pray that as we look into this particular subject that you have given us this morning, I pray that you would help us not only understand the principles of a biblical work ethic, but I also pray that you would help us to implement those things in our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, help our lives to be as believers, uh, those that, that live in such a way and work in such a way and respond in attitude in such a way that we give opportunity to share Jesus Christ with others and that they would listen. Thank you, Father, for each one that is here. And I pray that you would bless as we continue in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> CEO of a very large corporation was asked, he says, how many people, uh, the person asked him, he said, how many people work in your company? Now this man had some dry humor and his response was, not very many at all. And you catch that. <laughs> Large company, a lot of employees. How many work? Not very many of them work. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way it is in some of the businesses out here. We're finding, uh, uh, even coming uh, uh, back yesterday from up at, uh, visiting James, uh, my oldest son in Maryland, uh, we stopped at a, at a uh, uh, restaurant. Uh, I won't say which one, but uh, just got something to bring on to the house to eat. And... Um, it was taking quite a while and lack of uh, employees. We had stopped at another restaurant we thought was going to be open a little bit further up the road and it was closed. It closed after six o'clock because they didn't have enough workers to work. I was thinking, wait, how many people are on unemployment right now and yet all these jobs out here? Yeah, I don't know how that works. A lot of it's political uh, in some regards and uh, 
yet um, uh, it's hard to find some people who work. Some uh, employers will say, look, you know, I hire people and, and yet they don't show up and they don't even call and tell me that they're not showing up. They just don't come. And um, I think, you know, well, um, it ought to be that they can't eat either. Uh, if a man does not work, then he should not eat, the scripture says. And, and so it's important for us to understand that we are, as believers, at least, we ought to have an understanding of a responsibility to have a good work ethic within our life and to those that uh, we are working for, uh, that they would also recognize our work ethic as well. Uh, one man said, um, I like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and watch it for hours. I caught myself doing that one day. My neighbor was out cutting down a, a, a small uh, fruit tree and digging, trying to dig up the thing with its roots. And uh, I was sitting on the porch to sit down just to rest a little bit and I couldn't see too well. So I went out and sat on the steps and I, I was watching. I thought, hey, I ought to go over and help him. <laughs> um, but it was fun just to sit there and watch somebody work. I, I can appreciate that, but uh, we have to have a good work ethic as well. On a positive side, on May 1st, 1991, Nolan Ryan uh, threw his seventh no-hitter. His unprecedented achievement came at the age of 44, and reporters flocked into the locker room to hear his secret for his success. Uh, Ryan simply shared his belief in a strong work ethic that was handed down to him by his father. He said, stay faithful to your work routine. Just because you have a good night doesn't mean you change your routine. And then he started into the next week's routine. Uh, it is important for us to realize that the secret uh, uh, of continued success most always involves hard work. You think about the, the uh, Olympian athletes and the time that they spend in preparing for the Olympics. It is unreal, uh, the hours that they, they have, getting up uh, sometimes four o'clock in the morning and starting their routines of exercise and, and uh, training and going for most of the day, every day of the week until they get there to the, the Olympics. Uh, it is important for us to understand that it takes work uh, to be good at what we do. And it is important for us to have uh, a willingness to put forth that particular work. God ordained for us to work. In Genesis 2.15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You know, some people, I think, have a mentality that work was part of the curse uh, when sin came into the world, but it wasn't. God put a man in the garden, and he said, I want you to work. I want you to take care of the garden. I want you to take care of the animals. It was a responsibility for man, and it was a fulfilling responsibility for man as he worked. Uh, when sin came into the world and the curse, it just made work harder for man. Uh, as part of that consequence. So we have here that God has given us uh, uh, an, an ordinance there that we are to work. We are to put forth that effort and, and do those responsibilities. Um, for the believer, everything that we do, including our work, should be done with all of our heart. We're told in Colossians 3.23, uh, that we are to serve the Lord, we are to work, uh, do it heartily, whatever we do, as unto the Lord, not unto men. And the point that I want to bring out there is that this particular instruction that God gave us was tied to the servant-master relationship, the employee-employer relationship. Uh, we're told in Colossians 3, verse 22, it says, Servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And so when we think about working heartily as unto the Lord, it's not just our service at church, that certainly should be,
But everything that we do, including our jobs, since it was in the, the context of that particular subject, that we are to do it as unto the Lord, not unto men. Some people say, hey, you don't know my boss. You don't know what kind of a character he is and so forth. Well, I'm not worried about that. Uh, we're supposed to be doing our work as unto the Lord. I know what kind of character he is. And, and so we are to have that mentality that uh, we are pleasing the Lord in the way that we serve. Um, by the way, not with our service as men pleasers. Y'all recognize what that is about. Uh, I read one uh, um, a little humor thing. It uh, had about a guy. He was he was sitting at work. He was in his cubicle, and he was kind of his cubicle was there at the window. And he was kind of just sitting there, staring out the window. And the boss walked up behind him, and he called his name, and he says, "Why aren't you working?" And it kind of startled him and caught him off guard. And he actually said the truth. He says, "I didn't see you coming." <laughs> well, that's the way some people have the mentality of work. Uh, uh, when the boss is there watching, or they're putting forth the effort and everything, when the boss turns around and walks away, then they kind of slack off. Uh, I've seen that before, and I, I mean, you think, not here at church, but uh, in college when I worked for McLean Trucking Company, a whole lot of that went on. And uh, it's important for us to have good work ethics so that others can see that we're not just working when the boss is watching, but we are faithful, we are consistent uh, to put forth the effort even when we know the boss is not there to see because there is one other that always sees and we're doing it as unto the Lord. So the guidelines and directives uh, that apply to the servant-master relationship applies to us as employees and employers in that relationship and we are to do everything that we do heartily with all of our heart as unto the Lord and not unto men. Secondly, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, tells us that everything that we do should be unto the glory of the Lord. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And so we are to work uh, our jobs for the glory of God. We are to do it for that purpose. So with all of our heart, with all of our energy, unto the Lord, not unto men, and to do it for the glory of the Lord is what we're to do, to bring praise unto the name of God and uh, if we don't, then we bring shame to the name of God. And so we have to realize that our testimony as an employee is important because we represent the Lord Jesus Christ to the lost world around us. And we have to be living in a certain way that they're going to be willing to listen because they say, hey, I see something different about your life. What makes you different? like that. This refreshing. It should be. We ought to, to work in that capacity. Uh, evidently, because Paul addresses this with young Timothy here to as a pastor to share with the church, uh, evidently the church of that day was struggling with some of these things to sustain a biblical work ethic, uh, especially in the difficult situations that some of them found themselves in uh, actually in slave uh, uh, relationships. But Paul writes uh, here to correct these mentalities and he addresses two simple things. The first is he addresses serving a non-Christian master and then in verse 2 he addresses serving a Christian master. What's the difference and what should our mentality be? Well verse 1 gives us the who, what, and why that he is talking about. He says in verse 1 of chapter 6 in 1 Timothy, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Let every one, let every servant that is under the yoke, that's every one of us that we can apply today that has a job responsibility under our employer, uh, let us count him, that employer, worthy of honor, uh, that the name of God, that the doctrine of God be not blasphemed. And so we have, first of all, this who is he talking about? Well, he's talking about us servants. The word is doulos, as uh, one obligated to, to obey orders. <clears throat> Every one of us uh, that works under 
a supervisor or a, bo a boss of some sort, whatever the title may be, uh, we are in that relationship. We have that responsibility. We're obligated to obey orders. There's an illustration of it that I found uh, over in uh, Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew 8, verses 5 uh, through 10, we have uh, Jesus and a centurion guard that comes up to Jesus and says uh, his servant uh, is sick, uh, evidently close to death. And so we pick up reading in verse 5, and when Jesus was uh, entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lied at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Now let me stop first and say, now Jesus knew everything. Okay, you understand. He knew what this man, who this man was. He knew uh, what he was going to ask. He knew all about this uh, servant of his. He knew what he was going to do. But he tells the man, I will come and heal him. And notice what he says then. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority. A centurion was, was a guard, was a, uh, um, um, a soldier that, that had a hundred soldiers under him. But yet he was also under uh, captains above him. And so he says, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say unto this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Here this centurion had come to Jesus, and Jesus said, I'll come to your house and heal him. He said, Lord, you don't need to do that. I'm not even worthy that you, that you come to my house. Uh, but I recognize the authority that you have. And all you need to do is speak the word, because when someone is under authority, those in authority over them speak the word and they go and do it, like the soldier or like the servant, the centurion uh, Mark. And Jesus said for him there that he, this, this servant would be healed because of the faith that all you got to do is speak the word. And this servant of mine will be healed with great faith and the authority is seen there same thing with us when we are under authority all our supervisor should have to say is go here and do that and we should be about it because we're submitting to the authority that God has placed over us now I'm not talking about if you've got a boss that's asking you to do something that's immoral uh, unethical but, uh, but far as the responsibilities that you have, uh, I know of situations where uh, a boss may come in and say, hey, I want you to go and, and do this uh, real quick for me. And it's not their responsibility. Now, what are you going to do there? Well, my union boss says, <laughs> as a believer, I go and do what he says because he is my authority. It may not be my written responsibility, but I appreciate <coughs> and respect the authority that's over me. And I want to do those things that please them. And that's something that I think that we can do. Sometimes we're asked to do things that we know I don't need to do that. But then, are we going to submit? Or are we going to throw a fit? Which is most likely going to give you the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with that person? That's what God is talking about. So, as a servant, we're under 
authority with those that are over us and we need to recognize that that's who he's talking about what is he saying he gives us two directives he says count them a worthy of all honor the word count means to to estimate uh, based on an uh, objective criteria what is the objective criteria there uh, it means it's not based on our feelings but it's based on the facts of who they are who are they I'm not asking about a name, but I'm asking about a position. What position do they hold? We are to have respect for the position, even though we may not have respect for the person. There are some people that are working under a supervisor that would say, I am more qualified to be the supervisor than what this person is, but I've got to submit to what they say, and I don't think they know what they're doing. Well, guess what? You're right. You respect the position. I'm not asking you to respect the person. But when you respect the position, you're respecting the person. And you're doing it because ultimately you respect God. It's an attitude that we're to have toward those that are in authority over us. We're to count. Uh, directive number one is believers must have a correct assessment of the authority of their employers regardless of how they feel about them. And the correct assessment of the authority they have regardless of how we feel about them. We're to count them worthy of honor. We've seen the word honor before a couple of times here in verse Timothy in chapter 5. In verse 3 it says honor widows that are widows indeed. And then in, uh, in verse 17, uh, let the elders that rule well be worthy of double honor, especially those that, that labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, we noted that that word honor there not only means to respect uh, and to, uh, uh, to treat uh, uh, properly, but it also has to do uh, with the financial benefit. And so as an employee, we have a responsibility not only to respect those that are in authority over us, but we are to work in such a way that benefits them or the company financially. Part of the honor that we give unto them. It is a benefit unto the uh, uh, employer. So the second directive that we could say is believers must give respect, a proper attitude, and must give faithful service, proper actions there for the benefit of the employer. Over in 1 Peter where I asked, uh, Robbie to read this morning one of the a uh, couple of the verses that uh, that he read is in chapter 2 of first Peter verses 18 and 19 where it says servants be subject unto your masters with all fear as reverence respect not only to the good and gentle but also to the forward those that that are not so gentle those that are sometimes a, a hard uh, case to work with um, uh, then verse 19 says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, if, if you are disciplined for something that you do wrong and you take it patiently, God says, well, what's that to brag about? Why do you think good of yourself if you did something wrong and you got disciplined for it and you took it patiently? Why do you think that's something good? That's, I expect that. That's the baseline. But he says there, uh, the rest of the verse, but if when you have done well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And so in our work relationship, the servant master seen here in this context in our employee-employer relationship, when we have done what is right, we did our job and we did it as best as we could, and yet we get blamed for something or we get uh, fussed at for something, do we take it patiently? A work ethic. But you don't understand, it's not fair. Neither was it fair for them to do what they did to Jesus Christ. And he said, verse 21, For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered 
for us. Why do we get so upset when we've done right and yet we get blamed and disciplined, written up? Why do we get upset about that? A little thing called pride. And we need to realize that here in two we were called. We're to do right even if we get mistreated for it. Jesus Christ always did right. He never fought back. He never came back with any mouthing off uh, at the others. He did exactly in love as we would want him to do for us. And I know that that's what he would want us to do for our employers, to benefit our employer, our biblical work ethic. Why are we to do it? As we've seen there in verse 1, back again to 1 Timothy 6, uh, that at the end of verse 1, here's a purpose clause, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. The name of God and his doctrine, so that the reputation of God and his doctrine, his word, would not be evil spoken of. That's blasphemy. God would not be evil spoken of because of our testimony. God's word would not be evil spoken of because of the way that we behave ourselves when it comes to our jobs. Um, we're not to be disrespectful in any way, but we are to have a reputation of being obedient, working hard, and, and doing exactly what we are supposed to do, and nobody having to be right there to watch us in order to make us do it. That is part of that work ethic. Uh, it's important. Also over a few pages there to Titus chapter 2. In Titus 2, we're told in his work, work ethic and responsibility, begin, beginning in verse 9, he says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. Here's that servant-master relationship, employee-employee relationship. And to please them well in all things. Not answering again. It means mouthing off. Don't, don't be talking back to them and, and stuff and mouthing under your breath and, and all of when, when they say something. Not purloining, not stealing, but showing all good fidelity. Fidelity is faithfulness, dependability. That, here's a purpose clause, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. To adorn. To make appealing the doctrine of God, the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why are we to have a biblical work ethic? Why are we to, to work in such a way even when others don't? So that the doctrine of God would not be blasphemed. So that the opportunity to speak to another about Jesus Christ would not be hindered. Because if we are no different than the lost then why would they want to have what we have? It's only when we show the difference that God has made in our life. I've told you many times before that evangelism is kind of like one beggar telling another beggar where he can find bread. But if that beggar that's telling the other beggar where he can find it is starving to death himself, why would that beggar listen to this starving man, you see? But if God has satisfied me, if God has met my needs, if God is bringing that blessing in my life, then that person is saying, hey, I see what's different in your life. Where can I get some of that? And that's the opportunity that lies before us. But when we do not have that kind of a work ethic, then we are stumping uh, ourselves before we can ever get the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with another. So that the reputation of God and his word be not evil spoken of. One commentator said this, Christians uh, have a divinely commanded responsibility to live out their faith in the workplace, having a proper attitude of submission and respect and performing quality work are necessary prerequisites to proclaiming a believable gospel. Absolutely the truth. Why? 
when we're working with unsaved uh, employers. Now, the second verse, very quickly, is strive, uh, serving with a Christian master. Back over to 1 Timothy 6, verse 2, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. These are those that have uh, employers that are saved, Christians. He says, don't despise them. The word despise means to, to, dis, uh, 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 to be disrespectful, to, to under, uh, undervalue the authority of a Christian believer. You know, there are some people that look at uh, working for a Christian and they have this kind of mentality. Well, this is going to be a piece of cake because they're Christian. Yeah. I mean, we are, we're brothers in Christ. He's not going to expect too much from me. I mean, you know, cut me a little slack because I'm a brother in Christ, right? That's not the mentality to have at all he's talking about here. Um, and uh, uh, some people have that mentality because in Galatians 3, 28, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond or free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Do you know that means that we are equal? When we come together in assembly, we are equal as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now, when you come together in your workplace, he is a brother and you are a brother, but he has an authority over you in that situation. And you've got to recognize the difference. He may be Brother Bob here in the church service, but he is Mr. So-and-so, my boss, at the workplace, and I give him that res that respect. Uh, that's important for us to recognize in the difference. Um, spiritual equality does not eliminate job distinctions and responsibilities. We need to make the difference. And spiritual equality is not a license to fail to honor your employer. Um, we have that responsibility as well. It is a sin to be uh, insubordinate uh, or to give less than an honest day's work. We've got to put our best forward. And not only just to anyone, but especially if he is a Christian. Paul gives three reasons of why and shows respect that we should show respect to our Christian employer. Number one, it says because they are brethren, because they are Christians. Uh, the principle is found in Galatians 6.10 where he says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto uh, them who are the household of faith. We are to do good unto all men, but especially if he is a Christian. That's my boss. I want to be showing special respect. Secondly, because they are beloved. He said in verse 2 there that, um, that they are, um, I can't even find it there. They are faithful and beloved. So he is a beloved. Uh, we ought to have that kind of love for another Christian, another believer. Love does not look for ways to take advantage of or escape responsibility. True love is going to want to do our part the best that we possibly can. And thirdly, we're to do it because they will benefit. It says they're actually partakers of the benefit. Partakers includes both parties. <laughs> you know, that we are to work in such a way that our boss or our company or our, our, our store, or whatever, benefits because if they benefit, then we benefit. If they don't benefit, what happens? They close the company and you're out of a job. And so it's important for us to work, not just for that purpose, but that's part of the purposes of which we're, we're doing because it will benefit, uh, we'll be partakers of the benefit with them. A mutual blessing when Christians serve each other and, um, and do it in the will of God. Um, I have a question for you. What if a Christian employer 
doesn't do his part. What if you work so hard and so faithful and so good to benefit your Christian employer, but your Christian employer does not give you raises on a regular basis or doesn't help you in that regard, just kind of overlooks and doesn't do his part? What do you do then? Here's the quick answer. You do what God says for you to do. And you leave your Christian employer for God to deal with as he sees best. It's the same principle that I give you in a husband-wife relationship. If a wife says, you know, if I'm supposed to be this and do this and, and so forth in the household, what if my husband doesn't do his part? Well, then you still do what God wants you to do. And you leave God to deal with that husband or vice versa. It's a responsibility we have as believers. Don't worry about the person in the pew. Don't worry about the spouse. Don't worry about the employer. Don't worry about co-workers. You be and do what God wants you. And if we will do that part, then we can trust God to take care of the rest. God wants us to be what we should be. Paul closes the, the second verse there with telling Timothy to, to uh, teach and exhort these things, to preach, to, to, uh, to get it across to the people. And it's in the present tense. He says, keep on reminding them. Keep on reminding them these principles that are there. Uh, why? Because the principles are foundational to our Christian living and to evangelism, to our opportunity to be able to share Christ and therefore a biblical a work ethic that we're to have. I want you to bow your heads right now and I want you to think about what we've talked about. And I'm going to ask you right now to evaluate in your life what kind of a testimony do you have with your unbelieving boss? If you have an unbelieving boss, <clears throat> What kind of a testimony do you have with your unbelieving uh, co-workers, fellow workers? Is there something right now that God is bringing to your mind and saying, hey, your temper has hurt you or your mouth has hurt you? How you reacted has hurt you. Would it be something that God wants you to right now repent of and confess unto him and say, Lord, I was wrong? When we confess our sin unto the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And then to help us to get up and go do what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it. Will those unbelieving co-workers and boss, will they be drawn to Christ by your attitudes and behavior? Or will it further alienate them? What about uh, your Christian employer? Are there some things that need to be apologized for and changed? Right now, what is God saying in your heart? Father, I pray that we are listening, that we understand, and that you would help us, Lord, not to leave out of here today with sin in our life because we have responded incorrectly and we have not heeded your instructions with that proper attitude and proper actions. We may take care of those things and apologize where we need to and going forward that we would be the proper testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. We're going to have an invitation uh, very briefly. Um, I'm going to have the instruments go ahead and start pl uh, playing. And if you just bow your heads right now. Um, think about what God has asked of us. Are you willing to do what he has said?
Deus.